Thank you, Beth, for starting that applause. Good. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kelly Damphus, and I'm the Chancellor of Arkansas State University. On behalf of more than 1,000 faculty and staff members and almost 15,000 students at Arkansas State, it is my honor to welcome you to this evening's Riceland Distinguished Presentation. Let me take a moment to thank our friends with Riceland Foods, whose financial commitment to our university supports this lecture series. Riceland Chairman Roger Polner couldn't, couldn't be here tonight, so he's represented by the Board of Directors member Wayne Wiggins. To our Riceland Co-op members with us here this evening, thank you for your continued support, which has made both tonight possible and to make it free of charge as well to the audience. So thank you, Riceland. Events like this are wonderful opportunities for our students to touch history. I wanted, them to, I wanted to be sure that Mr. Clinton could find them when he was speaking tonight, so I asked all of our Red Wolves to wear their scarlet shirts tonight. Students, would you please stand so we can recognize you and so that Mr. Clinton can find you when he's speaking. Students, please stand. Interest in our guest visit was intense. In fact, the ticket allotment went so quickly, less, in less than one minute, all the tickets were gone. So we had several thousand online students at Arkansas State, and one of them actually wrote me and asked if there was a way that she could watch this event uh, online. And so we actually opened up, we're streaming this for our faculty, staff, and students who have access to my campus. And so Mr. Clinton, the entire Red Wolves family is here tonight to watch you. When Mr. Clinton returns to Arkansas, he probably does not need much of an introduction. That said, it is important to remind ourselves of some of his many achievements. His career of public service spans more than four decades, from our State House in Little Rock to the White House and beyond. He was the first Democrat U.S. President in six decades to be elected twice. His administration had, had one of the longest periods of economic expansion and prosperity in U.S. history. Since leaving office, he established the Clinton Foundation on the simple belief that everyone deserves a chance to succeed and everyone has a responsibility to act. And we all do better when we work together. For nearly two decades, the Clinton Foundation has brought together people from across the United States and around the world to create economic opportunity, improve public health, inspire civic engagement and service. How great was it, for example, to see Mr. Clinton work together with the late George H.W. Bush on tsunami relief back in 2005. But in addition to all of that, his personal story inspires all of us who work in higher education. When young people in our state see how access to a college education changed Mr. Clinton's life, I hope it inspires them and their parents as well. It gives me great pleasure, therefore, to welcome to Arkansas State University the 42nd President of these United States of America, Mr. Bill Clinton. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor, members of the Board of Trustees, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the legislature, and others. Uh, I am very glad to be back in Jonesboro, back at ASU. I thank Riceland for sponsoring this lecture series. I want to thank my good friends Wallace and Jamma Fowler for their contributions to this facility, and so much more. I have had a long and interesting history with ASU. Mike Beebe, our former governor, told me to be sure and remind you that I kicked him off the board here. to appoint Johnny Allison, who had been his fraternity little brother. It was a good deal. <laughs> you got a lot of Johnny's money, 
And BB was free to run for the state senate and attorney general and governor. Everyone came out ahead, except me. I have to listen to BB remind me that I kicked him off the board for the rest of my life. It's difficult for me to come here because I have so many memories. But I, I think I should begin by thanking someone who embodies the point I'm trying to make in my talk, and that is uh, my good friend Harry Thomason, who first approached me about this. And he and his wife, Linda Bloodworth Thomason, became famous not just for being from Hampton and from Southeast Missouri, but for designing women and evening shade, no less. I bet I have been to Evening Shade more times than anybody in this audience. <laughs> um, but they presented a picture of people that we could identify with, whether we agreed with them or not, or whether we always understood what was going on. They presented our humanity, and I appreciate that. My first speech at ASU was when I was Attorney General, my first year as Attorney General, 42 years ago. God, I'm getting old. Anyway, the president then, Ross Pritchard, whom I'd gotten to know, asked me if I would come and speak to the commencement. So I said, sure. And I showed up, and it was raining, and the commencement was supposed to be outside, so we had to move it into the field house, where it was wet and hot without any air conditioning. That was the true birth of what we first called the convention center. And as now your magnificent facility that sweeps the landscape. Then, as president in 1995, I was able to come back to dedicate the Dean Ellis Library, and I've been able to come back a number of times since. But I just thought you need to know, the first National Bank Arena began by people sweating in the old field house. <laughs> and uh, every time something new happens there, I get excited. This is a magnificent place, worthy of this school and worthy of all of you who can come here. When I was speaking in that really hot field house, my commencement speech lasted six minutes. <laughs> it was a wildly popular speech. <laughs> Not a living soul can remember a word I said, but they do remember it was short. All you budding politicians remember that. I think I'll take a little more time today. There is a a lot to talk about, I suppose, although I feel very much like a, an exhibit in a museum, like time has passed me by. I think most of the uh, political talk I listen to on television doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I, I have old-fashioned views. I still think it's a job being in public life. I think it really matters whether People are better off when you quit than when you started, whether kids have a brighter future or not, and whether we're coming together or being torn apart. I don't think there's much else that matters. And I think that we are living in a time full of truly stunning opportunities and deeply troubling challenges. And I can't understand why we're not seriously talking with one another about how to deal with the, both the problems and the opportunities. And we spend all our time, seems to me, doing something rather different. So 
I'd like to tell you what I think the big questions are facing our country and the world. Not in the hope that you will agree with me, but in the hope that you will think about this yourself. Because everybody needs a worldview. Otherwise, when you look at the news at night, it's like the political equivalent of chaos theory and physics. Right? I mean, it's just something new every day. And, um, and it happens fast, and you're supposed to decide what you think about it fast, and then what you're supposed to do about it is get on uh, Twitter and tell everybody else what you think about it so they can tell you what they think about it. I don't want to demean this. I go on Twitter myself sometimes, but I try to discipline my entry and largely confine it to things I think are important or people I think should be remembered, like John Dingle, the longest serving person in the history of American Congress, whose funeral I'm going to speak at in a couple of days, or Frank Robinson, who was the first African American to be a manager of a major league baseball team and still the only baseball player ever to be the MVP in both leagues. I knew them both, and they were friends of mine, so I said something. But I grew up in a very different time. And I promised myself when I was young that I would never become one of these cranky old men who said, you know what it was like when I was your age? I hate that. I think this is in many ways the most interesting, exciting period in human history. I think in many ways it is more full of potential. But the technology and economic and other forces at play in our world today do make it more difficult to have reasoned public debate, to conduct honest free elections, and then to find a way to get along when it's over. I tell everybody that America's made so much more progress than we mostly admit. In general, we are less racist, sexist, homophobic, and religiously bigoted than we used to be. We do, however, have one really deep remaining bigotry. We do not want to be around anyone who disagrees with us. And it is paralyzing. And I want to talk about that. And I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. I mean, look at this beautiful hall. This has been unthinkable 40 years ago when I first came here. America is still the best positioned country in the world for the 21st century. But we have to save our democracy, and then we've got to do something with it. Besides try to play games with it to stay in power. So I want to talk about that. And you are entitled to discount that because I had an atypical upbringing for today. I honestly believe if I hadn't been born in Arkansas at the end of World War II, without a television until I turned 10, I never would have become president. Because I grew up in an age of storytellers. In an age when it was easier to keep your eyes and ears open for people you were meeting because we didn't have a meritocracy based on education level then. For example, in a, you stopped to buy gasoline, people would still come clean your windows and pump your gas. And the person pumping your gas might have an IQ just as high as the town doctor. It just depended on the way fate dealt out the cards. Our main entertainment was storytelling. Like when I was born in Hope, once in a while, a square down to come to town, we did have one theater. If you were a kid, it only cost a dime to go. Can you believe that? For 20 cents, I could go to the movie and get a dime and a big Coke. 
I mean, for all you young people, look, this would be as close as you ever get to the mummies and the pyramids in Egypt. <laughs> but what we did have was each other and storytelling. I loved storytelling. And I, I must say, when people, I used to get the creeps when people say, oh, Bill Clinton grew up in straighted circumstances. I didn't think so. The per capita income of Arkansas was 56% of the national average. But I was taught that if you had a place to spend the night and clean clothes to wear, and you made it to the table at every mealtime, you were not poor. And there were lots of options available for how you could change or shape your life. So I loved storytelling. And the two best sources for me, when I was a little boy, I lived in Hope till I was six and I graduated from high school in Hot Springs. But when I was little, my grandmother's brother and his wife, my uncle Buddy and Aunt Ollie, had us all over all the time. All the kids had to work. I learned to shuck peas and make homemade ice cream. I liked the latter better than the former. Um, and we'd sit at dinner, but before you could tell a story, you had to prove you could listen to one. And that's a very important thing. I read all these commentaries today, sometimes on uh, somebody will post a tweet that I like, and then I just can't wait to read the commentaries. And it's either one strong, long chain of I agree with you, or one long chain of invective and how sorry you are. Right? And we've all read that, right? So I get the feeling that nobody's really having a conversation there, like lobbing mud balls back and forth at each other. That's not the way it worked when I was a kid. My uncle would look at me and say, Bill, did you hear that story? Yes. Did you understand it? I think so. Well, what did you hear? Then if I could explain it, I could tell a story. And somebody would do me the favor of listening and saying something about it. But it shaped my whole life. And... Uh, I stayed with that until I spoke at my Uncle Buddy's funeral when he died at 91 and I was president. And I came home to hope. Once, after his wife had developed Alzheimer's, uh, they had to move her out of their house because the house was entirely powered by gas. And she only knew who she was, you know, at the beginning, a couple hours a day, and they thought the house was going to blow up. So we had and hoped this nice little residence area that was connected by a, an enclosed corridor to the hospital. But it wasn't like a nursing home. You feel like you're independent, but you could get there in a hurry when you needed it. So during this period, when she had moved out and my uncle was still in the house and I was governor, I went by the same one day, just hoping to hear another story or two. He could always make me double over with laughter. And uh, at the time, his wife was down to 15 minutes a day when she knew who she was. And she would call him every afternoon and say, Oren, we have been married 56 years. And you leave me in this dump, this strange little dump, get over here and bring me home. This was a man that had already had a lung move for having lung cancer. He survived lung cancer when the survival rate was 15%. And he would shamble out to his car, get in there, and drive every day when she sent for him. And every day by the time he got there, she was lost in the midst of her Alzheimer's. But every day he did it. He was a, not only a brilliant man, but truly funny. 
And he'd been regaling me with stories the whole time I was there this night. And finally I said, buddy, I got to go home. I got to take Chelsea to school in the morning and Hillary's got a busy day and I do and it's getting dark. I got to drive back to Little Rock. And we were friends. I mean, really friends from the time I was a little boy. I was till for 50 years. And I'm going out the door and for the only time he grabbed me by the arm and I turned around and I looked at him and he was crying. And I said, this is really hard, isn't it? And he smiled all of a sudden. He said, yeah, it is. But he said, you know, I signed on for the whole load and most of it was pretty good. That's a pretty good story, isn't it? It's a lot better than waxing eloquence about the importance of honoring your bonds of love and responsibility. It's just a story. But once you hear that story, you don't care whether you heard it from a person who's white, black, or brown, whether a person who is liberal or conservative, from a person who's a Republican or a Democrat, you see a person who incidentally does such and such for a living, has this many kids, and has these opinions, like this kind of music. People first. The other source of my story was my grandfather. He had a little grocery store across from the cemetery in Hope. Cemetery is right where it is today. But the grocery store is not there anymore. Most of his customers were African Americans. And that was at a time when it was after the war. There were no food stamps, no Medicare, no Medicaid, no support. A lot of people were working for less than a dollar an hour. And believe it or not, it's just as it happened during the shutdown, there were people that worked all week long and still didn't have any money. So when my grandfather died, when I was 12, my mother found his old account books. And when people owed him money, he just write it in the account book. And there were still just this tiny little grocery store, a huge number of accounts that had never been fully paid off. But I heard him talking. I was just a little boy. And uh, I said, I asked him, I said, Papa, can people get food without paying for it? He said, no, not normally. But he said, you know, he said, Bill, bad things happen to people. And if somebody's working all the time and doing their best to support their family, they ought to be able to feed their kids. So I let them borrow the money in the form of food and hope they'll pay it back. I still live with that story. In 2016, I pulled my little campaign bus into a town in Ohio. And there was an African-American pastor standing there. He was in a, had a nice, uh, beautiful jewel cross on. I'm in a totally strange place. And he shook my hand. He said, I am Bishop Stewart. And he smiled. He said, but far more important for you, I am the proud grandson of Luther Black of Hope, Arkansas. And my grandfather told me many times about being in your grandfather's store when he worked his fingers to the bone all day long and still had no money, and how your grandfather made him take food home to his children. And when you ran for president, it had nothing to do with me. My grandfather called me in Ohio and he said, you gotta be for that boy. If he's just half the man his grandfather was, you'll be good president. And he said, so don't worry about me. I'm for Hillary, go campaign to somebody else. He said, I know you. <laughs> so the point is, the point is, We were people first. Nearly every debate we have could be resolved if first we were people. One of the reasons I think 
50 years from now, people will still be watching Harry and Linda's Designing Women in Evening Shade is because there's stories about people. And one of the things that leaves me aching is how we forget that. I am... Um, I called President George W. Bush the other day. And uh, when he was in office, I let him call me. Because presidents are busy. But he used to call me twice a year and we'd just visit about things. And it started one day when uh, I helped him solve a problem he had with uh, an American airplane that crashed on a Chinese island, you may remember that right when he took office, but anyway, he called to thank me. And we started talking and I said, look, you don't have to thank me, I'm an American. I, if I can help, I will. And if I can't help, because I can't, I'll tell you. And Hillary's a senator, so sometime I may have to disagree with you, but if I do, it will always be respectful. I will never say a hateful word about you. And I said, I know you don't like me because I beat your dad. I told him. And I said, believe it or not, I think that's okay. Because whether you believe it or not, I love him too. We had a deep, almost unbridgeable difference, but I do care for him very much. So you don't have to like me, but I'll help you if I can in good conscience. And I'll try not to cause you any trouble. And he laughed. And he started calling me twice a year. We talked about everything under the sun. I hope there are no transcripts of some of the things that we talked about. My point is, once he became a person to me and I became a person to him, he didn't stop being a conservative Republican. I didn't stop being a Democrat. We didn't stop having differences of opinion. But we began to be able to do things that helped other people. And down to the present day, that's what I try to do. We, he and I formed this Presidential Leadership Scholars Program. We've had some people from North Arkansas participate, you may know, but every year we take 60 people from a huge pool of gifted applicants to go to his library and his father's library and the LBJ library and the Clinton library to study important decisions made. They're young mid-career people, mostly, let's see, late 20s to early 40s. And then we ask the young people to come up with a project of their own that will make the world a better place and use the lessons they learned to do that. Every year, he meets with them once, I meet with them once, and then we do the graduation together. Every year at the end, they're more, usually they're almost 50-50 divided between the Democrats and Republicans, and it's really funny. When we get to the end, the Democrats go up to him and thank him, and the Republicans come to me and thank me because they didn't know there were any people in the other party like that. You mean like, and I, I was ragging somebody, I'm thinking, you mean like decent human beings? He said, yeah, like that. We had uh, one of the funniest encounters with these two deeply wounded Iraq and Afghan vets, both of whom were, had lost a limb, and one of whom was still fairly significantly marked, who became very close to this very large, very physically imposing African-American woman who was the leader of the gay rights movement in Little Rock. And the two soldiers said, we didn't know there was anybody like that on earth. But she's really smart. She's helping us figure out how we can help the veterans that we're trying to help. Only point I'm trying to make is I can tell you a hundred stories about this. We have to decide 
whether we're going to confront all these big challenges and take on all these opportunities that America has in a way that preserves our democracy. And the only way you can do it is to believe that the people with whom you disagree are people, and because they're important to the outcome, you're going to play by certain rules, and there's some things you just won't do. And I think that's important for a lot of reasons. We live now in an interdependent world. The good news about having a device that has the world's information on it is that you can always know what's going on. The bad news is that you're encouraged to knee-jerk a response within a nanosecond. When I was the age of those of you who are now like ninth grade and up in high school, we still had one hour for the evening news, network news, not 30 minutes. And when the president was on talking, the president was on an average of 43 seconds. Today, the average time you actually hear the president's voice is eight to nine seconds. And there's a big debate about whether the average human attention span to television is eight seconds or nine. It's got to be nine. A butterfly has a nine-second attention span. We're laughing, but that's what's happened. So there's more, but is it better? There's more, but is it wiser? There's more, but are we better balanced? These are just things that we have to deal with. And I am convinced... as I said in the beginning, that we are the best positioned country for this new century. But we have some fundamental things we have to get right about the way we make decisions. There's a lot of resentment today. We've seen it now for several years, but at least since the 2014 election cycle. I've rarely ever seen people just so seething with resentment. Doesn't really surprise me. I grew up here. I know what people have been through. I know that the main problem is never being poor. People can work their way out of that. The main problem is being stuck. And being stuck is different than being poor. The main gift of every university is not just the gift of learning, it is the gift of empowerment, of imagination, of the ability to think about options and make choices that can not only change your life, but can change the whole life of a state and a nation and a world. My foundation brings university students together every year in something called the Clinton Global Initiative, U, CGIU. And we ask them to come up with new ideas, and we try to raise about a million bucks a year to fund all of them, so none of them get very much money, really. All the good ones. But we actually had a, a young person with nothing who was obsessed with the fact that poor people in poor countries were getting medicine that was one in four packages were totally phony or completely adulterated. In other words, they weren't what they said they were supposed to be, or they were, but it had been ruined. And he developed an online tracking system to deal with this that worked like a charm. It worked so well that four years later, this guy, this penniless guy, <laughs> who started off with this tiny little grant, sold the company for $450 million so he could turn around and do more good. Why am I telling you this? 
One more story. My mother was an interesting woman. She was, <clears throat> she had four husbands. She was widowed three times. Her third husband was a particularly uh, wise man, I thought, who died before he was 50 because of a reaction to a medicine he began to take for diabetes and other problems after he had to bail out of his plane in World War II and landed on a coral reef that cut him open. But he was a very interesting man. So I'm 20 or 21 years old, maybe 22, the age of some of you near the end of your career at ASU. And I was, we were debating the Vietnam War. We were debating civil rights. We were debating, and, and I'm at the dinner table. I'm just so angry about this guy that I thought was a sanctimonious, hypocritical, self-righteous bigot. And I was giving it to him. <laughs> My stepfather looked at me and laughed. He said, you know something? Everything you just said is right. And if I were you, I'd never think about it again. I said, why? He said, this is bad for you and doesn't do any good for anybody else. He said, Bill, everybody's got things they can resent. We all have, forget about our phony resentments, we all have honest things that has happened to us or somebody we know or care about, that we it can understand you resent it. He said, but if you live in resentment, heart and your ears. And so he said, you're going to waste a lot of time, Bill, if you spend the rest of your life. And I was 22. He said, you're going to waste a lot of your life if you spend time resenting and feeling angry at all the people that do things that you can have no impact on. And he said, you're much more likely to change them if you set a different example. The people don't respond very well to be told them they're not much count. To the power of an example that works. So, soon, ASU, We'll have, as part of Black History Month, a screening of the wonderful film on my friend, Maya Angelou, whom Hillary and I knew very well, and whose funeral I had the honor to speak at at Wake Forest. A lot of you may know this already, but Maya Angelou spent an important part of her childhood in Stamps, Arkansas, Southwest Arkansas, during which, having been a Assaulted, she did not speak for years. And she wound up living the last several decades of her life with a voice that sounded like it came straight from God. She, in her first 40 years, had enough lifetimes for a dozen people. She spoke five languages. She was a professional dancer, she was an actress. She became a poet. She was the first female streetcar driver in San Francisco when she was a 16-year-old teen mom. She had a lot of obstacles in her way and she just kept on going. A couple years before she died, she was with me in 2014 at President Johnson's library when we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Civil Rights Act. And it was a wonderful group. John Lewis was there, the great basketball player Bill Russell was there, and there was Maya Angelou. Already she was in a wheelchair. But she always thought of the empowerment of the moment. So I was ragging her. I said, Maya, I'm glad to see you. How'd you get way over here from the East Coast? She said, just because I'm wheelchair bound doesn't mean I don't get around. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I ask you to think about this. There are lots of detailed, granular questions we need to face for the 21st century to deal with the positive and the negative aspects of our interdependence. What are we going to do about all this economic and other inequality? How are we going to deal with our need for a sense of social cohesion and the mandate of embracing our diversity? Will the explosion of artificial intelligence with nanotechnology, with robotics, mean that you, younger people, are about to enter the first technological shift since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution that will kill more jobs than it creates? If it does, what should we do? Do you favor having those of you who, who like to work, keep your full-time jobs, and then let's assume that productivity gains are so great that one in five jobs will be lost. You have two choices. We all start working four days a week, or those of us that stay working five raise our taxes to support everybody else not to work. What do you favor? I'm old and old-fashioned. I think everybody needs the dignity of work. But it's easy to say that and not so easy to figure out how to do that. Nothing in our modern political discourse lays the foundation for having the kind of conversations we need to have. This is not a Republican or a Democrat issue. It's not a racial issue, it's not an ethnic issue, it's not anything. This is a problem, it's a challenge. We have to figure out how to do it. So I have concluded, based on my very old fashioned upbringing and the reasonable success we had with broad-based prosperity when I was president, that cooperation is a better strategy for living and working together than constant conflict. And that diverse groups make better decisions than homogenous ones or lone geniuses. This is a pretty impressive group tonight. There's a lot of really smart people here. If we could find the smartest person here and take that person to a room and give you whatever you wanted to your heart's content for two days. And the rest of us poor suckers were locked in the room with stale coffee and old rolls. And 20 questions were fed into us over the next two or three days and to the genius. After three days, we'd be making better decisions than the genius. You can fill this auditorium with the studies that prove it. Different groups with different experiences and lots of common sense as well as intellectual firepower make better decisions than homogenous groups or lone geniuses. Therefore, this, the loss of our democracy would be tragic. The perversion of our democracy into a mud fight between opposing groups who never agree on anything is not in our interests. Do you know what it would take, really, to build a growing, burgeoning economy that added no more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere by 2050? Could we do it? We could. Could we do it and make money and create jobs? We could. But it would require a thousand small decisions that would require us to look at each other as if we were more concerned about our grandchildren's future than winning the next fight on a television talk show. Whatever side you're on. So I want you to think about that.
we know that in most sports contests, nothing's worse than a tie. And defeat doesn't seem like the end of the world because you get to play again next year. And often next week, depending on what sports you're playing. But so those zero-sum games are something deeply hardwired into us. Somebody's got to lose, somebody to win. And yet in economics, there's a lot of evidence that positive sum games work better. That when you find games that everybody can win if they work hard and make a contribution, that's a good thing. But somebody has to think about how you deal with all the challenges about how to get from here to there. That's what they're trying to work out with the European Union today. And it's what we need to work out in America today. For example, there's only one part of that big tax bill that passed a couple of years ago that I have much hope for. And it was a bipartisan addition by Senator Booker and Senator Scott, the Republican senator from South Carolina, to give us all more money if we invest in areas with higher unemployment rate and higher poverty rates, especially in small towns and rural areas that have been left out and left behind. The idea is to get all of us who may have some money but aren't billionaires to turn our attention to the prospect of becoming involved in business development so that the banking system, constrained by the rules that apply to banks to protect all of our assets, won't be alone and looking at those places for new investment opportunities. I have no idea if it'll work or not, but it's the first thing since the new markets tax credit that I passed back in 2000 that at least has the chance to work. Now, if you don't know what the heck I'm talking about, you should say, I would like an information system which would tell me about things that affect my grandchildren's future, that might give my kids a better future, that might help us to make something out of a place that too many people have felt left out and left behind. I could give you a lot of examples, but it all comes down to this. Cooperation is better than conflict. The only way to really appreciate our interesting differences is to think our common humanity matters more. Addition beats subtraction, multiplication beats division. It all sounds so simple, but it matters. There is a, there's a university, Morgantown State in, in, in uh, Eastern Kentucky, Moorhead State, which was selected to be a partner in NASA's project to bring the practical benefits of space to America. So in 2016, I was over trying to help Hillary in the primary, and they asked me if I would take a little time off from the campaign and just go to Moorhead State because I got the first money appropriated, your tax money. I spent $500 million of your tax money to start us in nanotechnology research, how to use very, very small computing power to have a big impact. And believe it or not, not in Caltech, not in MIT, but in Moorhead State, they were using this technology to build communications satellites You've seen them right on the TV. The average one weighs a couple of hundred, 300 pounds, and costs a couple hundred million dollars, hundred million dollars, I think. These cost, believe it or not, they weigh eight pounds, and they cost a million dollars a piece. 
and they do most of what the others do. And they're made at Moorhead State in eastern Kentucky, in the heart of coal country. So I go to this program. There's 12 kids from Appalachia there in the undergraduate program. And there's six in the graduate program, four from the Middle West, one from Vietnam, one from Ukraine. Otherwise, it was 100% Appalachian. So I'm, I go to this kid, and I want you to think about that. This is what ASU can mean to Arkansas's future and for Northeast Arkansas. So I walk in, and this 19-year-old young man from Eastern Kentucky, where everybody says all is lost, nothing good's happened, is jamming this nanotechnology computer stuff, the whole capacity, into a little thing about an inch cubed. And uh, I said, is that all the computing power? He said, yep, it's all we need. Just an eight pound satellite. I said, what is it carried in? He said, he held up the container and he did a little hillbilly twang. He said, tungsten. He said, tungsten does real well in outer space. And I said, where'd you get it? He said, I made it here with a 3D printer. And we talked a little more, and I told him goodbye. And he said, oh, Mr. President, he said, one more thing. He said, I see where they're making fun of your wife for saying she's going to build 500 million solar panels. I said, yeah. He said, I bet that's a popular thing to do around here. He said, actually, I think she's a little low. I said, you do? He said, yeah, I do. I said, why do you think that? He said, because pretty soon we'll be making solar panels with 3D printers. And they'll be just as good as the ones now, and cheap as dirt, and we'll all be free. This is a kid from the heart of coal country. I don't know if he's factually right about everything he said. That's not the point is. The point is that something had happened to him to make him feel that he wasn't stuck. And if you want to unstick America... And if you want us to lead the world to a better, more peaceful place, we have to think about empowering and unsticking people, not putting them down, making them feel bad, or pointing a finger at them to make them look inferior or dangerous so we can gain some short-term benefit. Just remember this, addition works better than subtraction. Multiplication is better than division. Creative cooperation is better than homogenous groups and lone geniuses. All the rest is background music. That's what I think about the modern world. And you're at a university, even if you're no longer a student. So I urge you to try to get other people to talk to you about this stuff. I urge you to try to overcome the temptation of resentment. I urge you to resist the sanctimonious feeling that if your resentment is real, you're somehow more authentic than everybody else. I'm not a young man anymore. I don't know how many days I have before me, but I'm pretty sure they're not as many as the days I got behind me. And yet I don't want to become old. You only become old when the weight of all your yesterdays outweigh your hopes for tomorrow. You can be young till your last day on earth, but you got to be going in the right direction. So I ask you to think about the 40 plus year journey I've watched ASU on. In my time in service, I ask you to think about your own dreams and how you hope to achieve them. I ask you to think about the wreckage in human history brought by the illusions of people 
that the most important thing was that they dominate over others. And realize that in an interdependent world, what you build is more important than what you break. I'm really hopeful. But in a funny way, and I spend a lot of time thinking about all this. One of the greatest honors I had last year was being asked to submit a statement to be read at the funeral of Stephen Hawking, the great physicist in Westminster Abbey. I couldn't believe it. Who'd ever thought a guy from Hot Springs that was a mediocre physics student would know enough to do that? I think about the black holes in the universe. I think about the species on Earth that survive because they're good cooperators, ants, termites, bees, and people. I think about things I never had time to think about before. But in the end, I think wanting to understand, wanting to respect, wanting to know, and then wanting to do with other people is what we have to recover. So whenever anything in your information ecostructure stands in the way of building a better tomorrow, a big alarm ought to go off in your head. We all have our resentments. We all have our regrets. But all we really have is tomorrow. And we shouldn't let our resentments or our regrets twist our tomorrows away from the bright path that lies before us. If only we can walk it together. That's what I believe. I was hoping from the minute I got in politics that education and economic opportunity an end to prejudice, opening more opportunities for women, for the disabled, for others, that all this would happen. There will never be a time free of problems. But this is your time. All of you who are young, particularly, you remember, this is your time. And you shouldn't want to trade being an American for any other country. Not right now. We have more possibility, but you've got to face the possibilities and the problems, not with resentment, but with an open hand and a listening ear and a loving heart. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President. <clears throat> I have a confession to make. I believe I made a mistake earlier on tonight when I mentioned that our students would be inspired by the story of Mr. Clinton, who left a place called Hope and went off to do something really special. I didn't give us enough credit, us old people. I hope all of us were inspired tonight, not just by his life story, but by Mr. Clinton's words, about the power of a story the power of seeing the good in people who don't look like us or sound like us or believe like us or vote like us, that there is good in everybody. And finally, the power of believing in the future, but having hope for a better world. I pray all of you were inspired by that tonight as I was. Tonight was the first night of many nights where we'll be bringing distinguished speakers here because of the wonderful gift of the Riceland Food Foundation. Thankful for that gift. Thank you for your participation here tonight. Have a safe and drive, drive home tonight. Thank you for coming. Good night.